Philosophers have long debated the nature of knowledge. Can we really know anything, they wonder. But the practicalities of science dictate that we have to work with what we have. We can only work with the things that we perceive, and that's all we have to work with. So we must assume that that is good enough to unlock the secrets of reality. If reality fundamentally consisted of things we could not perceive, then science would be in vain. But what things can we truly know? What foundation can we build our edifice of science on? We ideally want to be building our castle of knowledge on firm bedrock and not on shifting sand or swampy marsh. Currently, physical science is founded on the principle that matter is the fundamental building block of nature. It seems a reasonable hypothesis, but we can't prove it. Uh, for example, you can't prove you're not a brain in a jar, essentially. That's the ultimate <laughs> argument against being able to prove the existence of matter. We may have got to see it and perceive it, but you can't prove that your perceptions are not a virtual one. Anyway, so science is built, at least in part, on the swampy marsh of an assumption and it may be sinking. What else could we build our science on? Well, we'd find something that we could know for sure. Uh, building science on an assumption is dangerous in the sense that many brilliant people's lifetimes may be wasted chase, chasing red herrings down rabbit holes. It could be a terrible waste of human resources, if nothing else. There's one thing you can know 100% is true for yourself without having to read any books, although you might have to spend a little bit of time thinking about it, and that is this. Fun. All fundamental concepts are dualities. Light, dark, hot, cold, male, female, near, far, big, small, hard, soft, spirit, matter, and so on. The recognition of this principle is strangely absent from Western thought. Could it be the proper foundation we're look, uh, looking for? We're lacking. <laughs> could we build science on this principle instead of the matter assumption? Well, of course we could. The observer. Science is knowledge, and it's gained by observation and reason. Uh, and you and I are observers. What framework of knowledge can we use to interpret our observations, and what can we know with 100% certainty? As a human being, you can know 100% for sure that you exist, and that you perceive things through your senses, and through your mind and intelligence. All fundamental measures by which you perceive things are dualities. A duality is a one-dimensional relationship, like a string with the opposites at each end, um, with a line of variation between the two. So the fundamental units of physics are one-dimensional dualities, space, which is distance, and time, which is change. Along with perceptions that you have, um, this is something you can personally know as a human. So it's obviously important to consider this phenomenon of duality. First, of course, you have to be sure yourself that this makes sense in your own mind. You have to consider the possibility that, yes, all fundamental concepts are dualities. And you have to think it through yourself. Nobody can do it for you. Um, your perceptions, in fact, perception itself, relies on the existence of duality. Uh, because perception requires both observer and observed. This is a duality. Tao, or Tao, however you want to say it, is, it, it just means two. That's all it means. Uh, they're called yin and yang in the east, yoni and lingam in India, heaven and earth in the west, and many other names. So, it is the thesis of this website, and many other people, to be fair, that the Tao is real. It's in fact more real than you or I, because it exists at a higher level of reality, closer to the Creator, which is the most real thing. This is all explained as we proceed, but it corresponds to the seven levels I showed you earlier on. It's also my contention that the recognition of the Tao was universal across the West until relatively recently. And I would also contend that the loss of this concept has crippled um, philosophical and scientific progress in the West. It's crippled our thoughts. Um, yeah. uh, they are the fundamental substance of reality. And they are a one-dimensional relationship. They are a one-dimensional string. Thus they do define a form of string theory. But uh, modern string theory has it all wrong in the number of dimensions you know, and stuff like that. Anyway, relationship is the fundamental substance of reality. They have no independence uh, in existence. They are complementary to each other, and they only have re reality in relation to each other. They're not things, they are a relationship. And they are every relationship that exists in matter or in spirit. Yin and yang have opposite characteristics. They are a mirror image of each other. Their characteristics are well-defined, and they do not change. The doubt is not physical, it's spiritual, it's a concept, an idea. We are all thoughts in the mind of God. 
Yang, the masculine principle, provides. Yin, the feminine principle, receives. Yang is active, Yin is passive. This is perhaps the gateway concept into the Tao that's the most helpful. The word God is sometimes used to denote the provider, Yang, in a relationship in literature. And it is in this context we should consider the ultimate creator, the capital G, God of Monism, uh, is the one unified creator of all, and thus can be considered under this logic as the great Yang, where creation is the great yin, yin and is the Tao, in fact. So the great Yang creates the Tao, and the Tao is yin as a whole to God. Um, uh, the Tao is also nature, so God creates nature um, by creating the Tao, um, and nature is yin to God. Uh, this dualistic relationship defines nature. It's the primary principle by which reality is manifest. For there to be reality as we understand it, there must be separation between things. There must be the observer and the observed. Yin and Yang are thus the prime deities of nature. They are cause and effect. Science is the study of nature, and nature operates by cause and effect. Cause is Yang, if active, um, and Yin is effect, passive. Science itself could be defined as the study of causes and effects. Every scientific paper ever published is concerned with causes and effects of a particular system. Cause and effect is not an emergent property of reality. It's an intrinsic part of it, and without it, reality could not exist. Matter couldn't exist. It, implies in, uh, it applies in every single interaction between every object in the universe. Thus, it should be thought of as existing at a higher level of reality. And as we shall see, reality breaks down into clear and well-defined levels. Seven levels. Cause and effect, although it is a tree, I'll go back, it's seven levels, but it's a tree as well. So you can have many levels within each of those levels, and each of those will have four or seven levels, depending on which level you're looking at. Uh, sorry if it sounds complicated at the moment, it will get clearer. Um, cause and effect is part of a super-reality that our reality relies upon. Uh, thus, it is more real than our reality, not less real. The existence of matter relies on the existence of concepts such as subject, object, near, far, big, small. It couldn't exist without them. But the concepts could exist without matter. Therefore, the concept must precede the object. You can have a plan without a house, but you can't have a house without a plan. So, the name Tao, which is Tao to, um, it means it's, it's well embedded in our language, um, even though we perhaps don't realise it. So, the word for God, Deus or Zeus, means two. And the word day means two because a day comes in two parts, day and not day, night. The Egyptian goddess was called Nut, night, and night is the same word as not. So, it is day and not. Several European languages have gendered nouns. Um, that always was a mystery to me as a child as to why they would do that. Uh, why a boat would be female but the boat driver would be male? Well, it follows the yin and yang principle. Uh, to me this seems compelling evidence that knowledge of the Tao was part of Western thought in relatively recent times. Um, and also that there was a worldwide culture at some point in the past. Some independent researchers are now point pointing towards uh, the empire of Great Tartaria as being the most likely and most recent possibility of a world spanning high civilization. But there could have been others. Um, the properties of yin and yang. So we could have a quick look. If we click here, we can see a list of the properties. Um, we we'll have to make a couple of points again. So the yang principle is the archetype of all positive and good attributes, and yin is the archetype of all negative and evil attributes. We have a clear route to understand morality via the Tao that explains both good and evil but in terms that unify rather than divide. If something is yin in one regard, it has all of yin's characteristics, so we see that evil is also finite, it is an illusion, it is passive, amongst other things. It gives the context that is missing in Western thought. This is so important. Some may object that the Tao allocates the negative to the feminine and think it's sexist, but this is to misunderstand it. Both human males and females are yin to nature, um, the whole of nature is yin to God. Females may be yang to males. The Tao is a simple concept, but it's not simplistic. It takes time and thought to understand. And here at the, the earth level of reality, things are complex. Uh, the goddess yin archetype is allocated the negative characteristics with good reason, because when fully understood, it transforms evil into love. When you truly understand the Tao, you will find only love for God and goddess, 
And this is true freedom. Um, one thing that's very important to consider is that yin and yang, their attributes are relative and not absolute. Everything below the level of God is relative. God is the only absolute. So yang and, uh, yang and yin are relatively uh, these things to each other. Um, so yang can be relatively direct and yin relatively indirect and so on. Um, <laughs> so if you look at this list, it breaks down fairly easily. There are some things there that, you know, you might not understand why they're one or the other. But if you think about it long enough, you'll see why. Uh, it does all follow a logical and consistent pattern. And there are some rules to go with yin and yang. If it's uh, yin on the outside, it's yang on the outside and vice versa. Uh, the artist is active on the outside as he creates his work, but in his mind is the still picture of what he hopes to create, for example. The human asleep appears still and at peace, but on the inside, his body is at work. Every cell, every atom is in motion. His mind is dreaming off and adventures in far-off lands and so on. Um, and as the sun is yang, active and hot on the outside, we can predict that it's yin on the inside, i.e. it's cold and dark. Um, in time, yin becomes yang and yang becomes yin. This is really the story of the universe. Uh, yin becomes yang, the child becomes the parent. The dependent, immature, ignorant one becomes the independent, mature and wise one. Yang becomes yin, desire in an intent becomes reality and matter. So in synopsis, the Tao is something that you can know personally, 100% um, for sure. And it's a really good basis to build your knowledge on. It's better than building on the assertions of people you've probably never met. Um, it's a big subject, obviously I've just touched on it and covered some basics. Um, the uh, list I've made is, it may not be perfect, 100%, There's, the website itself isn't perfect, I'm only human. Um, and I don't have a huge amount of time, unfortunately, for doing this, but anyway. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope it was instructive, I'll try and do more as soon as possible and try and explain more in my inimitable way. Uh, I hope you find it useful. Thanks for watching.